taking a look at editorial for 12th October 2016. The first editorial in the Hindu newspaper, Bandwidth for Growth. This is regarding the telecom spectrum allocation auction which took place recently in which 2350 megahertz of telecom spectrum was put on auction and the results have been disappointing. We already saw in the news section that the 700 megahertz spectrum band which is used for high speed broadband connectivity remained unsold. So no, nobody bid it for this high spectrum. It was said that the base price of the spectrum is too high. So telecom companies had their own reasons and the government said that the telecom companies themselves are in a huge debt so they could not put in their hands in this. Anyway, the result is that the spectrum's sailing has not been up to the mark. The budget estimates had sought at least, you know, more than 66,000 crores, which they have received. It was double that amount which the budget estimates had said would be, uh, you know, achieved or received through telecom spectrum allocations this year. So it has been a disappointment. The finance minister Arun Jaitley says that this will be you know, taken up care of or covered up by the success which we got through the income declaration scheme of 2016 which has been successful so the amount of money which received from that will balance the sheets as such so that is there and uh, another thing which it speaks of is that uh, the telecom spectrums presently uh, have to invest more because we see that Indian market is, is huge, there are billions of users, a huge amount of talk time goes about per day, is used per day, data is used at high rates, but then the quality is a problem. So even the prices in India are low compared to international economies, other economies in the world, but the quality suffers. It also gives an example that in many areas where networks should work at 65% capacity, it works at 95% capacity, resulting in congestion and of course the voice quality and is affected. So there will be disturbances and call drops. So that is the problem. And also another thing which it points out is that Reliance Geo having come into the market, talking of free data services, the other telecom companies also are in the race to improve or you know to work on their this 4G data services rather than thinking about other aspects. So that has also been high on the minds of telecom companies. So that is also there and eventually the editorial concludes by saying that we have already seen one scam that was the telecom scam. Uh, during the UPA government where the CAG, Comptroller and Auditor General of India has say, had said that a huge loss was incurred to the government because the telecom spectrum was not auctioned but given on first come first serve basis. So that resulted in a huge controversy but presently the auctions have been conducted and there are no takers. So it says that government needs to learn from this episode and free the bureaucracy from the fear of the auditor and the investigator soon for better outcomes in all its plans. So that is the idea. Now the next editorial is a prized contract. This year's economics Nobel Prize was awarded to two economists who have done their work on contract theory. So contract theory basically talks of when a formal or informal contract or an arrangement agreement takes place between two entities, how do they come to it means how do they come to the tables and negotiate what are the factors which are high on their minds based on which they are able to come to a contract or an agreement. So the contract theory's major contribution has been on two aspects. So we all know it's it's generally known that so general equilibrium theory was already a known that whenever two entities come together into a contract they would actually see their own benefits and go ahead. But there are constraints in this. These two aspects of constraints were put forth by the two economists who have been awarded this year's Nobel Prize. These two constraints which each of them worked on, one was of inter informativeness principle and second one was about incomplete contracts. So informativeness principle is how much information is known to an entity to be ensure that uh, you know uh, the contract conditions are fulfilled. Means. Uh, like for an employer-employee relationship. If the employer wants to pay the employee based on his performance, so how well he has performed or you know, his, how he is working. So there cannot be a continuous uh, you know, vigil on the employee about how he is working. That is impossible for the employer. So this is lack of information. He doesn't have the information. So in such cases, how should the contract go ahead? 
so that is the informativeness principle so it also says that you know when you are incentivizing a performance say in performance of a manager so performance of a manager should not be incentivized only based on this you know share prices of the company but it should be means how well the company has done but it should be based on comparative analysis of other competitive companies so how share prices of your company are faring as compared to other companies share prices so how well your company is doing compared to others so based on that if you incentivize the manager then it's better because other, there may be other factors which are resulting external factors which are resulting in the economic company not doing well for which the manager cannot be blamed and his incentives cannot go low so that was one aspect which was put forth in this contract theory by them which is a claim and also the contract theory can be used in various streams presently it's talking of employer employee relationship entrepreneur investigator relationship in today's startup you know era and also constitutional laws how should they apply in aspects of privatization how should it be gone ahead with corporate governance even in schools and of course companies so that's the idea and the second notion of incomplete contracts incomplete contracts basically means that whenever a contract is is uh, you know finalized it is based on various you know situations so in such a situation this would take place in another situation this should be the you know path one ahead but then all possible situations cannot be predicted so unforeseen circumstances do emerge so no contract can be a complete contract so you should work according to these you know keeping these unforeseen conditions situations in mind contract should be finalized that is another principle which was highlighted so this uh, the second part of the editorial talks of this being the only social science prize and of course the economy nobel prize was not the original prize conceived it was started off later than other nobel prizes and it is seen that since 1969 when it was started till 2016 a uh, majority of them out of 48 38 have been us residents and and 10 have been british residents so it shows that this nobel prize for economics is more so given to you know market economics rather than on social democracy so it says that only one person so far has been awarded a prize for social de democracy that means how government should provide for their people a work done on that so that is the, uh, the highlight of this editorial too so these are the two editorials of the hindu next we look at the question bank the first question in the question bank is on yemen we have seen yemen uh, crisis escalating presently we saw in the news also that a uh, you know a burial procession had been targeted and around 140 people died and more than 500 got injured in this attack which has been blamed on saudi arabia by the houthi rebels so talking about the entire thing for the question put forth is yemen is in the midst of a huma huge humanitarian crisis what are the causes for the same should they be of any cause of concern to india so they first talking about the yemeni crisis the, uh, the it all started with the arab spring which started in 2011 when the ruling president of yemen that was ali abdullah saleh was forced to step down because of public protest so this was a wave of public protest which we saw in various countries it started in tunisia and spread to other regions across to in arabian countries egypt saw a change so syria the problem is still going on that all started with this public protest so here also the public protest resulted in president stepping down but then his his vice president came forth as to the to power he had been ruling this ali abdullah saleh had been ruling for more than two decades so that was what was seen that true democracy had not been established in these countries when a government stays in power for so long then of course you know it becomes lax so there are there were problems and public protested against this and yemen as such is also a very poor country in, uh, in the arabian peninsula so there were and now the vice president also had been rebelled against the houthi militants who are shia militants and yemen saudi arabia are sunni dominated countries and shia domination is more so there in iran so iran saudi arabia conflict has always been there it's a, it's an age old conflict based on this sunni shia aspect so now these houthi rebels who are shias are have become powerful in yemen and they are acquiring power and you know they are also led the new president evict means his palace and his you know residential complexes were bombed so that resulted in him leaving 
so then finally now houthi militants have become powerful this uh, new president also fled and went to aden you know a port city in yemen and finally he fled to even riyadh saudi arabia so saudi arabia also entered into this crisis in 2015 march and then since then it has been bombing the entire country wherever these houthi rebels are powerful but there have been many civilian places which have been targeted and attacked and many civilians have lost their lives so the yemeni crisis has escalated because of these bombings and saudi arabia is supported by usa USA also provides its intelligence and support to Saudi, so that is also another highlight. So the the attacks are still going on. Now, what needs to be done, and what is India's stand on the matter? Of course, India is not directly affected. This is the map. Yemen lies here. Aden, which is a port city here, had been part of British presidency. This is the Arabian Sea. India lies across over here. Had been part of uh, British presidency. uh bombay presidency as such during british colonial times so aden has you know some relations with india colonial india so that aspect is also there and many indians go to gulf countries so that relation is also there when this crisis escalated india had been sending its forces to even bring back indians back to the country so that all aspects we have done in the way it affects us we have responded but how to respond to it internationally is what the uh, what the article questions that people these days have become immune to attacks and you know violence in the world means we see them in newspapers and we just flip pages it does not bring in our conscious or awaken our conscience it seems as if to live in this global world we need to accept all these Which take place. So India as a nation also is accepting these without raising its voice, without without presenting its concern and waiting for the Western countries to respond and support them. So that is not you know what a uh, what is called for from a country which wants to be you know dominant internationally. So we want to have a presence felt. So we need to speak up. So in terms of not just Yemen, in Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, where these conflicts are going on. so that is what the uh, article speaks of the next question is the complexity of economic data in india make gauging the status of the indian economy difficult elucidate so this is regarding the different data which are put forth by the government on a monthly basis there is gdp data gva data then there is also iip in, in gdp means gross domestic product gva is gross value addition then there is in, index of industrial production iip so one comparison being made is about gva and iip on manufacturing both give data on manufacturing but both diverge so when such divergent data has come up in front of a person then he may not be able to go how the economy is actually doing so you know iip manufacturing measures gross output or the absolute amount produced by the manufacturing sector. and gva manufacturing measures total contribution of labor and capital in the manufacturing process so this is completely different so gva shows that it's doing well iip shows that there's not enough output so labor capital is been put in but the output is not coming in so what do you understand from such conflicting economy data is what is questioned in this article and inflation figures again we have wpi wholesale price index and cpi consumer price index so how these two indices also have different products under it and different weightage given to different categories so they differ so what do you do of such data is question also income tax paid paid is also one good indicator for economy that how the economy is doing but then again the income tax payment by the country the civilians is also very low only 5.5% of those people on pay income tax so there is a large chunk of corporate tax which also which is you know gone into zero taxes because of subsidies and incentives given so that is also not a feasible way to talk about you know, how the economy is faring also data release it says monthly basis release of data does not give a good idea and finally also how much of that data is authentic is a question so this is what is question and of course the new gdp figures which came up also brought in controversies with it so that is also a problem the last question is on hungary's referendum in eu which mandatory refugee quota which eu has asked it to accomplish that was put on referendum by hungary and it has been rejected by the people on, by a huge majority though 40% voted 95% of them said we don't want this quota so this how refugee crisis should be tackled eu has also been refuted now 
and Hungary it says that Hungary itself had uh, you know a huge refugee crisis during anti-Soviet revolution and you supported it so how can it reject this right now so that